This week, we're taking a special journey back in time to one of our most popular episodes released way back in 2018. In this encore presentation, let's rejoin the world of macro photography with Don Komarechka, a master of the unseen and the overlooked wonders of the natural world. Now, Don's work is not just about capturing images, it's about storytelling and exploring the universe in ways that our eyes just can't perceive on their own. So let's sit back, relax, and re-explore the microscopic with Don Komarechka. This is Twit. Have you ever seen these macro shots that just look impossible? because the depth of field is so great from the, the tack sharpness of the in the front of the image all the way through to the back of the image. Well, usually that's done with a technique called focus stacking. Don Komarechka is here to show us that technique and a couple of more interesting tidbits while we watch him work. Don, welcome to the show, man. Thank you, Frederick. I live and breathe these techniques through most of the year, so uh, it's fun to be on to talk about that and to not just talk about how um, how the software does it in an automatic way, but yeah. how you can take control of that, you know, from a pixel peaking uh, perspective and really make it as perfect as possible. Uh, and I also want to show the techniques required to shoot the images beforehand because that's where everything starts, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, share your screen. Let's dive right into it. I want to make sure that we uh, we soak up as much of your brain as possible. All right. So uh, here we have my my Lightroom display and we're going to be working on this image uh, first and foremost. Now this is a straight out of camera photograph which uh, there's a lot that has to happen to get us in camera results like this. It's not perfect mind you. If I were to uh, to go to a different image in this set you'll notice that the focus is shifting from one image to the next. In this version you can see that the refractions inside all of the droplets are pretty sharp but nothing else in the image is is really sharp in comparison to the previous image. So I have photographed this, uh, it's a blade of grass actually, a blade of blue fre uh, fescue uh, with a um, an African daisy or some sort of daisy-like flower in the background. Um, now if you take a look at the whole image, the background that's out of focus, all those nice blurry soft lines, that's mm -hmm. the flower uh, in the background that is coming into focus inside each of the droplets. So let's start in camera. How do we get this? Like, what is the magic, the secret sauce to make that happen? Well, here is a photograph of my setup. This is just a quick cell phone snap after I took the shot. Uh, it's a bowl of water on my kitchen table, uh, judging by the Easter basket, probably sometime in April. <laughs> and uh, in, in this setup, uh, I have what's called a third hand tool, which has two alligator clips on a little swivel base, and that is submerged underneath the water. Uh, it is clamping down onto the blade of grass on either end, and the clamps are completely submerged. It only emerges from the surface of the water right where the water droplets start to appear. Um, so that is the functional setup that probably took me about three or four hours to arrive on because there's a lot of tinkering, there's a lot of experimenting, there was a eureka fail moment here because uh, I, I you know, created beautiful droplets and you'll notice that there's no droplets on the flower in the background. Mm -hmm. um, so it was mm -hmm. placed into position after the droplets were created. Lowering it into the water displaced some of the water, raising the water level enough to eat all of my droplets. <laughs> so that sucked and I had to reset the experiment and there was a lot of little moments like that that just require the camera to not even be present in the scenario. You're just constructing a subject that is then worth photographing. Um, so if I were to go back to one of the images in that set, it uh, doesn't really matter which one, you can see the camera is pretty straight on and very, very low to the surface of the water, yeah. um, as parallel to it as I can get to get the strongest reflection possible. I don't really have to worry about the clamps in the frame because they're too far off to the left and the right. This little distortion that you see in the bottom uh, right-hand corner, that's one of the clamps, and that's easy to clean up in post if I needed to do that. Um, lit with an off-camera flash that is held, if you can even see the catch light in the droplets themselves, it's uh, up and to the right. Um, that is lighting both the flower in the background and the blade of grass to create this as a final image. And that's a uh, single or, That's a single, a single light source? Is there any sort of reflection or it, anything? No, this is just a harsh, uh, it's not even diffused in, it, in, in any way. This is a Canon 580EX2 speed light yeah. um, that is bare and, uh, and sending its light onto the subject. Nothing special, nothing fancy. Uh, I think I was using an off-camera shoe cord and just hand-holding both the camera and the flash for this, uh, but I was going to ask about that. Like, how do you support the camera? So you're not supporting the camera. You're you're supporting the camera, and the reason you can do that is because you're shooting with flash, and that freezes everything. 
right? Well, exactly. And if I if I take a look at this, you can't really see the front edge of the table, but I can rest my arm against the table, and my arms will be pretty much a tripod at that point. And it'll give me the flexibility to move the camera left and right, up and down, changing the angle ever so slightly, such that I have the ability to rotate the camera with the water droplets as the center of rotation. And this is really important because if you're on a tripod, the tripod is going to be wherever the tripod mount is, is where the center of rotation is going to be, right? Yeah. So in this scenario, uh, I have to have the flower, the center of the flower in the middle of each of the droplets. I'm focusing on the droplets, but the framing has to be such that the flower is centered inside each of those droplets. And it is. You can see it's a little bit off on, on that side. You know, It's a little bit higher in the droplet there. But if I were to look at the bottom, that's as far as I could push it because I'm losing it down in the reflections that's down in the bottom half. So um, this isn't just a quick like Photoshop flip it and mirror it because real physics doesn't quite work that way. Getting the exact angle is really important. And sometimes when you're locked down, you're not going to get it fast enough, especially because uh, these water droplets are evaporating. You've got to work quickly. They're not big things. They'll disappear in about 10 minutes. And if you spend that time fumbling with a tripod, then you've got to reset the whole experiment and time is wasted. So yeah, yeah, that's, I have. That's so cool. That is so cool that you're, I mean, what a big takeaway from this for, for folks that are watching this is that you created a work of art. It's beautiful on your kitchen table with some water <laughs> droplets and a flower, right? So the excuse of, well, I don't have money to travel and, you know, I need all this other stuff in order to make great images. Look at what Don did on his kitchen table in Easter with an Easter basket sitting off to the left. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, this kind of work, I'll often spend three or four hours working on a setup and I don't know what I'm going to end up with when I start. I'll have a few ideas, but that's never what I end up creating at the end of these experimental sessions. So the, the, the vast majority of the hard work is done in camera. But in post-processing, that's where you really put the polish on this and make it a finished piece that is perfect. So I've got, uh, I think it's about 11 separate frames here, each of them at a slightly different focus point. Um, I would have shot in more than 11. I've just cherry-picked these uh, to be just the ones that I need so that I can select them and send them off to Photoshop as layers within the same space, which is how I deal with focus stacking, especially when you want to deal with manual corrections to make things perfect. Mm -hmm. So to do that, it's pretty simple. Uh, I just click on the first one, hold down my shift key, click on the last image in the series, and then right click. And uh, in here, we have the edit in menu. And somewhere towards the bottom is open as layers in Photoshop. Mm -hmm. It's very important that you don't choose the top one, because if you choose edit in Photoshop, you're going to get 11 or however many images you have opening up as separate images. And that's useless for you. So open as layers in Photoshop is where we generally want to go. Now, I've already done that so that we don't have to wait for that to happen. Um, so this is the workspace in Photoshop, where you can see in my layers panel on the side, I've got all of those 11 layers uh, you know, accounted for. Uh, it might take, depending on the image that you're working on, uh, it might take, I don't know, five, 10 minutes for that to, to load in, especially if you've got a lot of photographs. Mm -hmm. I brought these in as JPEG files, just so that the next process doesn't make us watch progress bars go by for a long period of time. But once you've selected all of the layers here in Photoshop, the next trick is under the edit menu, choosing auto align layers. Now, this will, in most cases, just choosing auto is going to behave perfectly fine for you. It's going to find all of the, uh, the areas of each image that should be overlapping perfectly and overlap them the way that they should. Before I do that, I'll show you. If I unclick certain layers, you'll see that none of these are in sync. Every one of them is in a slightly different position in the frame. That's yeah. the nature of the beast when you're hand holding an image. So long as you get them close enough to, to center, then the next process works very, very well. The issue is the floors in our old kitchen were really spongy. And if somebody walks by, like the rippling on the surface of the water will cause the reflection to end up in a different position as well. <sighs> Jeez. So wow. that you have to manually fix. There's no automatic uh, process for that. And Photoshop sometimes gives a bit of a breathing artifact um, in this particular image. But if I just click on auto, uh, it will throw all of these images up into active memory, align them all, and spit out the results uh, pretty quickly. So while it's so, doing that, Don, just a quick question. So the, well, two questions. Do you do your, your color correction and, and, and those sorts of general edits on the images before you bring them into Photoshop? Or do you do that on the final focus stacked image? I do everything that's important in terms of color and uh, and detail. So noise reduction, uh, white balance, et cetera, mm -hmm. in the raw file, because you've got more flexibility there. But to be honest, an image like this, 
there's no real sense of of real color. I mean, yeah. I don't have to match it perfectly to what the flower originally was, uh, so long as it's pleasing to me in the end. So yeah. a lot of macro photography, color accuracy, um, really only comes into play when you're comparing uh, an image on your screen to what comes out of a printer. Because a photograph like this is not going to print the same colors. These really bright magentas are often out of gamut, and you've got to sway them around a little bit. But that's another rabbit hole. And then the, uh, the second question is is about the the images that you import into Photoshop or you send over to Photoshop from Lightroom. Right here, I'm seeing you have JPEGs in there, right? So right, that was just to speed up the process. What's so what's not... normal? What do you normally do? Raw files, and then when a raw file gets sent over to Photoshop, um, it will say .jpeg in the bottom corner, but uh, or, or .dot um, cr2 in the bottom corner. But it's no longer a um, a cr2 raw file. It is now a TIFF file. Okay. And they'll it. often come in as 16-bit TIFF files. Uh, so you no longer then have the flexibility to correct for wildly uh, incorrect white balance uh, or other unusual things that might have uh, hurt the image. But to be honest, if you just take them from Lightroom, do some very basic stuff, I'll typically recover the highlights and the shadows just a little bit because I can push them back um, afterwards. Then we get to here. But this was right out of camera. I didn't do anything to this image. Uh, now they're aligned in a way, but if I click on the different layers, you'll see that there's a certain breathing effect where uh, the images, the, the reflection specifically, is not in the same position. If I click from different layers, you'll see oh, yeah. uh, it yeah. kind of moves around a little bit. And uh, that, if you want to have pixel perfect accuracy for focus stacking, that's going to be a nightmare for you. So we're going to have to go through and fix that. But before we do, I'll show you the simplistic sort of 80% um, of the way process to create this as an image. So um, I would then, after I've done the auto align, choose auto blend layers. and it will automatically, in most cases, detect that you are doing a focus stack because they're pretty much entirely overlapping each other. If for some reason you had one or two images that are way offside, then it might default to panorama. Just make sure that you've got focused or the, the stacking images checkbox uh, selected. And what's on by default, but I usually uncheck, is the content aware, uh, aware fill, the transparent areas, which would be the edges of the frame. We're going to be cropping in from that anyhow, so it doesn't really make any sense for us to fill that data in. Um, if you have a slower computer, by the way, this is the one process that will take time, especially if you have a little bit of RAM and you need more. I mean, go make yourself a sandwich, go for a walk, <laughs> come back, and uh, this process will be completed. Once it gets to the halfway point, it generally speeds up. But uh, Frederick, have you, do you have any experience whatsoever in focus stacking? Very little. I've, I, I understand the concept, and I know some cameras will actually do it within the camera itself, which is another question I have for you. Mm -hmm. um, but no, no, I, I, I know how to do it, but I've never done it. So this is fascinating to me. Right. And if you can do it in cameras, in some cases, that's great because the camera can shift the focal length of the lens. But in doing so, it also, uh, to change the focus, it also changes the field of view slightly. And it gives uh, a different effect when you're trying to focus stack things in post uh, if you wanted to handle it that way. So would you, so would you recommend, go. would you recommend doing it in post even if you have the, the facility to do it in camera? If you have the facility to take the images in camera, by all means, do that. Um, but you have to be buttoned down on a tripod. You can't be doing the same kind of uh, push the camera forward and backward with your hands technique, yeah. uh, which uh, arguably will give better results depending on the scale and, uh, and orientation of your subject. For really, really small stuff, um, this is probably the better technique. Got it. So I'm just going to jump back a step, because this is the unfocused stacked version of the image. and. That's the focus stacked version. So uh, you can see, especially the unfocus stacked one, nothing in the refractions in the top is clear. And then the focus stacked one, the entire top is pretty darn good. It does fall apart in the bottom, though, especially where we had those little ripples where it's Photoshop is trying to draw things in properly, but the same object is in different positions no matter how you slice it. Yeah. And this is a problem that we have to solve. So what I would typically do here is. Um, in order to uh, stop us from watching that progress bar again, I'm just going to uh, do a little trickery. What I would normally have done is I would have taken my layers that are all completely aligned, and I would have duplicated them. So I would have right-clicked on the layers, and I would have chosen Duplicate Layers. And it creates an entire new set of layers, doesn't matter what we call them, that are all called Copy. And I would blend those. So what happens now is I have this set will become the finished Photoshop automatic composite. 
but I still have all of the original puzzle pieces here that are all perfectly aligned as well. So um, I will just paste that in because I don't want the progress bar to go again. But imagine that I had blended that entire set and then merge that into a single layer. This is the Photoshop composite mm -hmm. that I would then bring to the very bottom of my layers and let it sit down there. Now, fun trick, if you want to turn off the visibility of multiple layers at once, just click on one and drag your mouse up nice. and it'll hit them all. Um, so then I would start from the bottom up and fix every single issue with every single layer. Now, I know specifically the top layer has a really nice fix, and we're not going to spend the entire time going through every layer here, but I will just redo the order. You're going to go through them all no matter what you do anyhow. So if I were to turn this layer on, you'll notice that the, uh, the water droplets in the reflection, they are much more pristine in this version, in, in this slice of focus, than in the Photoshop composite that it created. So what we're going to do here is we're going to click uh, that layer on and create a layer mask. And you've got to get really familiar with the, uh, the invert uh, key combination, which is Control or Command I. Because if I press that back and forth, back and forth, I can see easily where Photoshop has messed up. And this layer is actually better. So painting white on a black mask, I can easily go in and fix those little finagly mistakes. Look at that. That Photoshop misbehaved for yeah and so i can move over to a different part of the image and again going back and forth back and forth just kind of playing a which one of these things is not like the other and don well, while you're doing that i have a question for you so yeah it, this image fantastic right this is great and I'm, I'm learning volumes doing this was this possible in any way shape or form you know let's say 20 years ago uh, no, <laughs> uh, at, at least not the way that I'm doing it now in, in any semblance of this being a reality. You could composite different things in the film era for sure, yeah. but overlapping layers of detail like this, no. uh, I, I don't think you could do it to be honest. Yeah. So you, you film purists out there. This is a reason why we love digital. <laughs> exactly. It gives us a lot more flexibility when it comes to, to post-processing. And again, I get really finagly about these little tiny details. One pixel might be out of place, and I might try to uh, to fix it on on a layer or the one next to it. And I would just keep going. I'll skip a few and just choose something like this. And I'd zoom in really close and, and you, say, you said "Okay, in the beginning, well, you said in the beginning that this. How long did this image long. take you from from concept to completion, or what you felt was uh, completion?" In camera, about three or four hours, and in post, maybe an hour or two, just okay. to make it all perfect. Okay. Um, and so you can see this line here on this layer is really nice, but the Photoshop version of it has it blurred. Yeah. So I would go and I'd paint that in. You know, it's the attention to detail like this that makes the image uh, what I consider to be uh, one of my favorites. So yeah, even I think this it takes it from probably... amateur. It takes it literally, like looking at the the focus stack version of it without you know or yeah I, I guess just yeah just the focus deck version without you making these corrections it looks good and i'm like oh wow that's a beautiful image but then when you get in there and you start doing all this you take it from from good to great or even amazing so yeah i totally get it if you go the extra mile to make this sort of stuff work out the best for you then uh you know that extra five percent not everybody's going to notice but the important people will notice. The people that are going to buy this as a print are going to appreciate the effort. The people that are going to put it in a magazine or an art gallery, they're going to appreciate the fact that I made these uh, these droplets as perfect as they can be. I'm not I'm not choosing any technique here that alters reality. In fact, what I'm trying to do is preserve reality as best as I can, and so that's kind of the goal with focus stacking from my perspective. Yeah, yeah, I love it. And you know, yeah, you're shooting this for other people, but in the end depending on your level of ADD, right, you, <laughs> little details will bug you, right? So this is... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I again, this would take me uh, on average about an hour or two to kind of get a proper balance between where these droplets are supposed to fall together. And it's fun, uh, right? I mean, it's and fun. you know what? This, this ends up being muscle memory for me. It's like knitting a sweater. I don't have to think about it. I'm talking to you. I'm not even thinking about what I'm doing, really. So I typically will binge watch Netflix when I'm doing focus stacking work. It just makes makes the whole process a little bit more sane. There you go. Do you do you uh, while you're doing this? Like if you if you're binge watching or listening to music, and I asked I asked uh, Troy Miller the same thing. 
Um, does the song that you're listening to or the series that you're watching embed itself in your memory with this image? So when you see that yeah, image, so you I, remember? I know that I, I was watching Star Trek The Next Generation when I was editing this image. <laughs> See, it's in there. It's in there. It's in there. It was a dialogue driven show that I didn't really have to look at in order to to make sense of. So I could focus on my focus stacking. I wonder Uh, I wonder if those programs make them so make their ways into the image itself. So like on some sort of different plane. I don't know, maybe. Yeah, where is this kind of infused? You're watching something angry and somehow your image takes on an angry feel. Quite possibly. Um, it's really hard to say, yeah. but uh, I, I believe that there is some impact on there uh, to some degree. Nice. And then, you know, at the end, you're just going to put on the polish. When I'm cropping this sort of work, I'll often go back and forth and really kind of guess uh, at a crop and then ponder it for a few minutes and say, okay, well, does that work? Do I want to bring it in a little bit more on the sides? Do I want to shave a little bit off the top or the bottom? Am I looking for complete symmetry or should it be offset? Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll, I'll, honestly spend about five, maybe 10 minutes just finding what that perfect crop is going to be because the edges here are so abstract and I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to come up with in the end. Um, And it's all arbitrary. Uh, It's not going to conform to a specific aspect ratio. Um, So, you know, there, there's that, but. Now does, does the, like, so with that, with it being arbitrary and not conforming to a specific aspect ratio. So you're not, you're not creating these with the ultimate destination of being printed on some standard, you know, 11 by 14 or 16 by 20 print, right? If, if I'm going to be printing this, uh, I've printed this on canvas. I think it came out to like 38 by 20 or so. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do my own printing and I can choose my own sizes uh, willy nilly. And um, and if you've got a boutique printer near you that's like owned and operated by one guy or a handful of people, they'll be able to to work with any file in any aspect that you send them if you want to have it on canvas. Cool. Um, a lot of the art stores will sell stretcher bars in tongue and groove sets that you just can build yourself. So it's not a hard thing to do. If this was to be printed as a fine art print on photographic paper, I'm probably going to have it custom framed and thereby I'm not going to worry about the aspect ratio there either. Okay, cool. And then, you know, also if it's, if the only place is going to be shown is online, then all bets are off. And then it doesn't matter at all. Yeah. Exactly. One thing where I do try to conform to my aspect ratios is when I'm doing snowflake work. And uh, so I've got uh, another little treat here for you, Frederick, Lovely. is uh, this is a series of snowflakes. You can see the individual frames if I jump back to Lightroom here. Um, and uh, these are downscaled because this is uh, this would have been 40 or so separate images as, uh, as focus stacking slices to put together. Um, but you can see how little focus comes into a single snowflake frame. Yeah. Now, these images in camera, I'll typically underexposed by about a stop because I know I can boost that up and I'm not going to get a whole lot of noise. Noise is never a huge issue in macro photography, but there's a lot of specular highlights that are just barely almost overexposed, but not quite that I could pull back Mm -hmm. when the snowflake is exposed at this level. So um, in an image like this, while I might use around 40 or so, let's see how many is actually in this particular set. Uh, There is uh, 58 actually, because this was a bigger one. I would have taken between two and 300 images of this particular snowflake and then weeded out the duplicates or the ones that were out of focus on either end. Uh, And the same process for this, you would just right click, edit in, and then open as layers in Photoshop, which of course I've already done. So in Photoshop, uh, and I've already uh, done a little uh, step to align. And if you take a step back, you'll notice that you can see the edges of the frame. They're not perfectly aligned, Mm -hmm. uh, but they're pretty close. My movement was pretty darn accurate here. Uh, You were were hand-holding this one as well? Hand-holding. You'll notice that some weirdness on the top edge of the frame is going to come into issues with focus stacking because the snowflake was really close to the edge. And in some frames, it's in the shot. And in others, the frame gets clipped. And Photoshop is going to be confused about that. Uh, But again, that's what would be solved when you go through that manual correction process. Now, uh, just to save you all of the trouble of watching a very long progress bar complete, um, then I can, if I get out of the crop tool, it should let me jump forward. There we go. So wow. there is the focus stacked snowflake. Now, I probably missed some frames from this setup just by looking at it closely because there's a few little areas that are a bit soft, but I'd know that a little bit more closely once they would go through and fix things up. As I mentioned, the top part here is a bit mucky. Um, I don't have the detail in that uh, the way I see it. And if I still don't, by the time I go through and manually correct every one of these layers, then I hunt back through my original images that I did not select and find ones that would have this area unclipped and in focus and uh, and carry that forward there. And bring it in. So this is focus stacking in a nutshell. 
the average snowflake takes me about four hours in post to edit. Um, there is a trick here in order to get the background nice and, uh, and clean and crisp. Because uh, if I condense that back down to a single layer, and again, I'd be going through every layer here, but I'm just taking this Photoshop version, putting it at the bottom, and then turning off the visibility of all of the 58 other layers. But the one at the top is actually pretty close. Maybe uh, I'm going to try to find one that is even closer, but it doesn't really matter. I'd find one that is as close to the outer tip as possible. Um, this tip of the snowflake is furthest away from the black mitten that it's photographed on. So if I were to take this layer and paint the background on from this layer, the background is mostly out of focus. So that saves me a lot of trouble when it comes to cleaning up the background for these kinds of images. You're harvesting uh, and, other images, right? Yeah, well, you're just taking the most out of focus version of the details that you don't care about. Uh, again, you said at the, at the get go, focus stacking is all about getting it in focus front to back from the ingredients that you want to have in the frame. Right. Uh, in this case, that background with all of those fibers, that is unwanted. So I would go in and I'd, I'd of course, do a better job, but uh, uh, that gives you at least a foothold into getting the, the image nice and clean and crisp and isolated away from the background that it's on. And this image, again, just just a little back to the future, a shot like this, a, fo a focus stacked photograph of a snowflake, which obviously is minuscule and tiny, this would have been impossible any other way than with not, not even in the you know, forget about film, even fast forwarding till today. Are there any lenses that are capable of resolving this level of depth of field on an image this small without focus so stacking? <laughs> Yeah, actually, this is actually quite a big snowflake. It might measure eight or nine millimeters across, almost a centimeter, which in snowflake terms is a giant. Yeah. Um, and so if you use a lens like the Canon MPE 65 millimeter, uh, the new Laowa 2 to 5X macro lens, which is available on more platforms, Metacon has a 4.5 uh, or yeah, 4 to 4.5X macro. There is gear out there to do this. Um, but it's been the possibility for uh, decades or maybe centuries to put a microscope objective on a camera. And you can use a microscope objective on, um, a lot of them have a, uh, uh, a barrel focal length requirement of around 200 millimeters. So I, I've actually shot snowflake images using a 20X microscope objective, although this is done at much less magnification. Um, you can get them pretty cheap on eBay and uh, you can adapt them to fit on the front of any 200 millimeter lens or any lens that covers that focal range. I use my 100 to 400 and, uh, and you can do that. In the past, uh, uh, Ushiru Nakaya, I think was his name, a Japanese researcher in the 1950s. Uh, he did a lot of work with snowflakes and studying their patterns and their shapes. Uh, and he said, you know, we tried photographing snowflakes using reflected light because this is light coming from the direction of the camera, mm -hmm. not from behind. And that gives me all these beautiful surface details that uh, a lot of them would otherwise be invisible. Um, and he said, you know what? It's really, really hard. We're not getting anything useful. We're just going to use transmitted light, which in that case, you'd have the snowflake on a piece of glass, and you would have the light come back from behind. Um, dial back to the late 1800s, and um, uh, Wilson A. Bentley uh, from Vermont was famous for that, a snowflake photographer out there, and is still famous today for his work. But to use reflected light on a snowflake, it means it cannot be straight to the camera. If the snowflake was straight to the camera, then the light hitting the subject would have to come from inside the lens and then bounce back through the lens again both ways. And there is hardware to do that, but it's laboratory equipment. It's not anything that you can hold in the field. Um, so I photograph on an angle with a ring flash, mm -hmm. and that angle has to be very precise. If I'm off by about five degrees or more, then I don't get the nice reflective nature that we're seeing here. Um, and then start out of focus on one side, using my hand as an anchor on the table that the snowflake is also resting on, push through focus, rapid fire burst. My flash has an extra battery pack attached to it so that it doesn't, uh, um, it doesn't give me blank frames. And then when I'm, I'm satisfied that I've gotten everything, because if I, if I just shoot 40 frames, because I think that's the average, I don't realize in this case I need 58. Yeah. Or if I shoot 58, I don't realize that I might have gotten the wrong ones. So that's, so that's interesting. Just, your I just want to put, I want to put a pin in the choreography of what you just said, right? So you, you, you've got everything set up. You've got the camera set up. You've got the, uh, but you're hand holding the camera. You've got a ring light there, which is critical for this kind of thing, right? So you've got a ring light with an extra battery on it so that it will maintain the rapid fire of your camera and you hold the shutter shutter down in continuous high 
and slide the subject. You're not moving the camera. You're sliding the subject. No, I am subject. moving the camera. The camera is still handheld here. Uh, okay, so you're moving so, the camera. You're you're just you're sliding the but, camera over that focal range. Exactly. So if you're holding the end of the ring flash with your index finger and the thumb of your left hand, mm -hmm. and of course your camera standard grip on your right hand, face smushed up against the optical viewfinder, your left hand that's holding the end of the lens, the side of your hand is resting on the mitten itself or the table uh, that you're. Uh, so it acts as a very good anchor, and you can rotate the camera around that with your right hand and find the right angle that you need. So all you have to do is really just nudge forward with your left thumb just slightly, and that's enough to pull the focus through the entire snowflake. Wow, that's crazy. We're working at such minuscule, little tiny, tiny uh, distances here, like every little movement, breath, gesture, blink, somebody walking on the floor next to you changes your everything, right? <laughs> Exactly. It's a very temporary, very transient subject. And a lot of people say, well, why don't you just use a tripod and take the extra time? Yeah. Well, in a snowflake like this, especially when you have these dainty little edges, if five minutes go by, some of those little branches near the outer tips are gone. They will have sublimated. They would have ev evaporated from a solid. And the snowflake becomes uh, sort of a, a globular version of what it used to be if a half hour or an hour goes by. So timing is really critical. Uh, these images are taken as soon as they fall. And I'm out there with a little artist paintbrush cleaning one off from any clutter that's around it so that I can get in and take the picture. You know, how do you capture these? It just starts, you're in Canada, so there's no shortage it's of snow. It's snowing right now and it's almost <laughs> mid-April. <laughs> See, it's in California. Like, what would you suggest for Californians? Where do we go to get snowflakes? Uh, find a mountain somewhere. <laughs> yeah. you know, Yosemite. Uh, go up to a high elevation, and uh, you might not have to go quite as far to get the shot. Yeah, but you're going to have to get a room up there. And, and, and you know what? You might stay there for a week, and you might not get any good snowflakes worth photographing. Uh, the, this snowflake, I remember specifically the day. Um, a friend of mine in a city just south of me said, Don, it's snowing outside. It's really beautiful. Take a look. And I looked outside. There was nothing at the time. The radar said absolutely nothing. There was nothing in the forecast. But I checked back again a half hour later when that storm would have been up to me. And this was falling from the sky. I could see the stars. It was unpredictable, unannounced, and I spent uh, a good part of the night just out photographing these uh, these little gems. And so, how do you catch these? these are, you said these are on a, on a black mitten, and you just kind of stick your hand uh, out, grab yep. it. And a, a homemade black mitten. You can see all the little fibers of, uh, of the mitten in the background. Um, the uh, the mitten actually works really well to isolate the subject. You know, you've got a good contrast on it. Yeah. Um, but it'll often lift the snowflake away from the background so that it's easy to make the background nice and clean. And yeah, I'll have to clone out a few little uh, issues here and there. But because it's only making one or two points of contact it's also acting like an insulator and it doesn't melt the snowflake as quickly as say it would fall on the uh the lid of your barbecue yeah wow fantastic really educational man thank you for doing this you're welcome. This this is right in my wheelhouse, this kind of work. And focus stacking is the the way to get the, the final results, but you got to get the material in camera. Uh, there is no substitute for that. Uh, the focus stacking is just what you know brings it up to another level. Yeah, yeah. And how do you feel about how things like computational photography are affecting this kind of work? Do you see a future where you know, you snap one picture and the, the, the computer will apply algorithms to it and figure out depth of field so that you can make choices later in post? I, I, I don't know. I've talked to an astrophysicist uh, about, uh, you know, he, he's a photographer, but he studies physics on the side. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he was pretty keen uh, on the idea that computational photography can solve a lot of problems, but um, that from a single point of view, you cannot overcome diffraction because the, the information from diffraction basically becomes lost when it passes through the aperture uh, of your camera, bending light off course from where it should have gotten. And even if you can predict the trajectory of where that is, without having a, um, a slightly different angle for different reference or uh, different apertures of the same setting to, to gather more information, computational photography cannot um, remove diffraction, which is why these images are shot at relatively wide apertures. Apertures. Because if you make that aperture smaller and smaller and smaller, then yeah, technically your depth of field will increase, but the resolution will go down mm -hmm. substantially and you'll get what it amounts to what you think is a blurry photograph, but diffraction is the culprit to prevent that. I'm not going to say that it can't be done, but right now physics is having a really hard time even theoretically saying that it's going to work. So I think we're safe for a while. And what about um, 
the the megapixel count I mean, some people are looking at this and saying well you know don probably has the largest camera made by man taking these, these were done with 18 megapixel uh sensors 18 um, nice yeah this was done with the 1dx uh and i've since upgraded to the 1dx mark ii which is 20 megapixels but it's in the same ballpark yeah. you don't need a huge amount of resolution in fact when you're dealing with these kinds of images that resolution while on paper and in the file it's there diffraction hits a 50 megapixel megapixel sensor far faster than it would a 20 megapixel sensor. So while yes, you are getting a 50 megapixel image, you might not be getting 50 megapixels worth of resolution out of it, mm. depending on what your aperture is set to and what your effective aperture is, which changes when you get closer and closer to your subject. That's why that, um, you know, if you set your aperture to f2.8, and you think everything is great. Well, in some cases, when I'm photographing, well, this is a big snowflake, but when I'm photographing some of the smaller ones, um, I might be at 12 to 1 magnificent and the general rule is you add one stop uh, for every magnification factor that you have to get your effective aperture in macro terms. Um, and if you add 12 stops to f2.8, you end up somewhere around f180. <laughs> and uh, no matter which camera you're using, diffraction is going to annoy the heck out of you. Yeah, yeah. Well, fantastic, man. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. So let's I appreciate you having me on here, Frederick. This has been a lot of fun. I enjoy this kind of stuff. Yeah, me too. This is great. So um, before I let you go, I know you got to get on to your day and capturing more star, you know, snowflakes and all that stuff. Where where should people go if they want to see more of this kind of work? Like particularly if they want to see your snowflake. And though know, there's one shot that I want to, I need a URL to. You did a shot of a Canadian flag in a snow in a in a uh, water droplet. Where is that? Yeah. So that's actually two stages. That took about four months to create. Here, let me see if I could find it quickly, and then I'll bring it up on the screen as a final farewell to uh, to this particular. Um, so th there's basically two images uh, involved in that. The first one was creating not the Canadian flag, but creating um, a, a version of a photograph in a uh, water droplet. So uh, let's see if I could find it here, uh, that particular one. There we go. So... This image, if I may share my screen once more, mm -hmm. this shows that image that you're talking about, right? So there's water droplets and there's what appears to be a Canadian flag in that image. Yes. Um, but that is actually a photograph that I had taken um, that laid real red maple leaves on a bed of fresh snow um, that took about four months to create because I had to preserve the leaves uh, by ironing them between wax paper and then wait for that snowfall, uh, you know, just after a fresh snowfall, bright sun, no wind. And this is one of my most common, uh, commonly stolen images to date. Uh, it's my most popular photograph, I guess you could call it. Um, and that day that I took this image, uh, which was January 11th of 2009, marks the date that I became a professional photographer. It's the first time that I had an idea that I was able to execute that nobody else had done before. Yeah. But then you don't just stop there in my eyes. You can take it farther because I took a print of this that was a little bit uh, more square so that it fit the water droplet a little bit better. But I put it behind a spider web that had water droplets on it. In the uh, the water droplet refraction image that I showed you earlier, this one I put a flower in the background, and I typically use flowers. But you could put anything you want in the background, including a photograph. And so that can spark a lot of creative ideas for people, and uh, hopefully that inspires you to think outside the box. Um, what ingredients can you possibly mix together here? Again, the magic happens in camera, not in post, although the post processing helps. Um, where can you take your own ideas? And uh, this is just another example of where I took one of mine. I love it, man. Thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate it so much. Let's put you back on camera so we can say our farewells. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Perfect. Um, uh, and you know, you were saying where we can go look at this stuff. What's the URL? Right. If you if you want to right, if you if you want to learn how to take photographs of snowflakes yourself, I've got a website dedicated just to that. That's skycrystals.ca, where you can buy a book that I published on that topic that goes into every possible detail uh so feel free to check that out but uh, if you want to see a portfolio of my work on a wider scale then go to doncom.ca has all my links to social media and as i said i love chatting about this stuff so please hit me up send me an email and uh, i'd be happy to, uh, to carry on awesome. the conversation Don Komerichka, thank you sir thank you okay take care this is twitter